G'day and welcome back to the channel. Welcome to RC Model Reviews and today some science on the whiteboard. Now I've done a video on my XTech channel which is pointing to this video because I had a lot of people, well I had a few people who were bitching, grizzling and moaning about the fact that I was flying a very small lightweight FPV model in a park without an observer and that it was a risk to public safety. And so I'll put a link to that video in the description of this one in case you haven't seen it, in case you've seen this one first. In fact, I'd recommend you go and look at the other one, then come back and look at this one. But anyway, let me go on. I wanted to show you how to calculate the kinetic energy of any object that's in motion and how that energy represents the risk that it poses to anything in forms of a collision. Right, so I took several everyday objects for the purposes of this piece of science. I took a softball, which is like a baseball if you're in America, but and it's not softer. It might be a bit lighter, I'm not sure, but it is. It's a pretty hard ball. It's a plastic ball with a vinyl sheath. So if you get hit on the head with it, it will really hurt. Okay, so I took a softball. I took a football. And when I say football, again, for the benefit of our friends in America, I'm not talking about an oval ball. I'm talking about a round soccer ball because soccer is the most widely played football sport in the world. And the, the Poms, the English people, uh, back in Old Blighty there, they love their soccer. And this is a soccer ball. So it's, it's a ball, that, and soccer's played in South America, it's played in New Zealand, Australia, everywhere. It's just about that there are people, there is soccer. So most people can understand the, the size and weight of a soccer ball. And I also got my FPV sub 250 gram model, and I used that as one of the entries in this little matrix of information here. All right, so those are the objects that I wanted to measure the kinetic energy of, because if you go to a local park, those are the things that you might encounter. You might find people throwing a softball backwards and forwards, kicking a football around, or if it's my park, you might find me flying my PV model. So let's look at the relative energies of these things, because really, let's talk about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement. Kinetic means movement. So. When you have an object at rest, it has zero kinetic energy. But when you move it, when you start moving it, as long as it has uh, movement, it has kinetic energy. And if that bangs into you, ooh, it's the kinetic energy that's transferred from the object to your head or your body or whatever. So the more kinetic energy something has, the more likely it is to injure you. It makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and energy, kinetic energy is calculated from two factors. There are two factors in the calculation. One is the mass Oh, by the way, before we go any further, kinetic energy in the metric system is measured in joules. That's the unit we'll be using to measure. But that to calculate kinetic energy, you need to know the mass or the weight of an object. And I say the mass or the weight because on Earth, planet Earth, they are one and the same. If something has a mass of one kilo, it weighs one kilo. Not true on other planets. If you go to the moon, which only has, I don't know, I forget what it is, but is it 0.6 of the, or 0.5, or I don't know, some smaller amount, then it will still have a mass of one kilogram, but it will weigh less. And if you take it to Jupiter, it'll still have a mass of one kilo, but it'll weigh a lot more because the gravitational force is much stronger on Jupiter. So ignore the other planets. We're only going to deal with planet Earth because I haven't got enough range to fly on either the moon or Jupiter. So we'll stick to planet Earth. Um, so we measure the mass in kilograms, and it's the same as the weight. So that's good because we can use scales to measure the mass. Um, we also need to know the velocity. Obviously, now, if we look at this, I've got a can of WD-40 here. It's got a lid on the top, really light, but this is full, so it's quite heavy. Now, if I move them both at the same speed, the can has more kinetic energy because it weighs more. So if, if I was to move this in, the cap into my head, ooh, doesn't hurt, but the can, ow, that could hurt because it has, for the same velocity, it has more kinetic energy. That's the way it works. So mass is a factor. We have mass as a factor of this formula here to calculate the kinetic energy. The other factor, of course, is the velocity. If I move this can really slowly, then when it hits my head, it doesn't hurt at all. Because although it's still the same mass, it's moving slowly. So there's, there's not as much, it has less energy. So there's less energy to impart on my head. So we, velocity is another factor. But you'll notice the velocity is squared in this formula, the, which tells us that the velocity is actually more of a factor. It's, it's not even so much how heavy something is, it's how fast it's going that makes the difference. So if you increase the velocity by a factor of two, if you double the speed of something, you actually increase the energy by a factor of four because you square. So it's two squared, which means you multiply by four. So we end up with the velocity being the really crucial factor. So fast things are more dangerous than slow things. That's why bullets kill you. But an idling vehicle, if it hits you in the leg, probably won't. Even though the idling vehicle might weigh a ton or two and the bullet only weighs you know, a fraction of an ounce. Sorry, metric, only a few grams. So you see that velocity is the really important thing, but mass does have an effect as well. Right, so um, to calculate our kinetic energy, we take half of the mass, just take the mass, divide it by, by, divide it by um, 0.5, no, multiply it by 0.5, divide it by 2. 
um, and then we multiply that by the square of the velocity, and that gives us our mass. Now, velocity is measured in meters per second. Because we're metric here, we don't use kilograms per cubic hectopascal of whatever, I don't know, but we just use metric because it makes life so simple. And the Americans, we'll have to look up metric and see what it means. And one day, you will use it too, and you'll move into the 21st century along with the rest of us. Should have got a few thumbs downs in the comments, shouldn't it? Anyway, so let's look at uh, how we measure these things. Now, as I said, we can measure mass with scales. And so I got my lovely softball. I went, I didn't have, I've got a softball somewhere. I couldn't find the damn thing, so I had to buy a new one. Went to the local equivalent of the Walmart, you know, department store. Wandered down the aisles. I found myself a softball, and it was nice and cheap. And so I bought that softball. I bought it home, or brought it back to the studio. I threw it on the scales that don't show the blood, and they told me that the softball weighed 195 grams. Woo! Um, so here's our little matrix. I've got the, the three objects we're looking at here, which is the so softball, the football, and the FPV model. And in the columns here, I've got the mass, and I've got the velocity, and then I've calculated the, the energy. But in mass, because we're measuring in kilograms, although that, well, that softball weighed 195 grams, which is 0 0.195 kilograms, so I had to put it in a 0 0.195. That's the mass of our softball. Then I got the football. I also put it on the scales that do not show the blood, and it was obviously, as you'd expect, quite a bit heavier. It came in at 433 grams, which is 0 0.443 kilograms. Put that in the column here. And then I got my FPV model, which, true to its name, is sub-250. It measured in with battery all ready to go, even charged up with a plethora of electrons. It came in at 248 grams, or 0 0.248 kilograms. So we've filled up the mass. We know what mass is for each of these three items. And so then I needed to calculate the velocity. How do I do that? We need to measure the velocity. How do I do that? Well, the simplest and most logical method would have been to get a radar gun and throw or kick the balls at it and then fly the model at it. But I don't have a working radar gun at the moment. I've got one I built myself, but I've stolen some parts out of it and must put it back together. But anyway, at this stage, it's non-functional. So I had to come up with a new idea. And I thought, well, what is velocity? We need to know the velocity. And what is velocity? Well, if we look at the units, it's meters per second. It is distance over time. So if we, know, if we have a known distance, fixed distance, we know how far something is, and we know how long it takes an object to travel that distance, we can work out the velocity in meters per second. So I came up with a cunning plan. I got some pool noodles, because I got lots of those, and I put them in the ground three meters apart. Measured it with a tape measure, three meters exactly. So now I have a known distance. All I need to do now is measure the time it takes for the two balls and the FPV model to travel between the poles. How am I going to do that? I've got a camera. So I set my camera to 50 frames a second, and what that means is that every 20 milliseconds, every 20 thousandths of a second, every 200th of a second, the camera takes another picture. So I can then count the number of frames between when the object reaches one pole and when it reaches the other pole, and from the number of frames I can calculate the number of milliseconds, and from that I can calculate the number of milliseconds required to travel one meter, and from that I can calculate the number of meters per second. Get this number here. So I did that. I filmed each of the individual things and counted the frames and did the conversion. And here's what I got. The softball has a velocity when I threw it, and uh, uh, momentary aside here, I'm 67 years old, nearly. I'm in my 67th year. Um, I don't throw or kick nearly as hard as I used to. You can ask my wife, she'll tell you. Um, so these figures are really on the low end of the scale. How many, you know, I mean, 60, 60, a 66 year old man is not going to be putting a lot of effort or energy into these things, right? So nevertheless, my softball traveled at 18 meters per second. 18 meters, that's as fast as I can throw it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Other people, much faster. Um, the football, I got 11 meters per second. That is appalling. That's abysmal. My legs made of spaghetti or something. I don't know, but it was, I wasn't very impressed with my kicking skills. I'm sure that a, you know, a younger person could kick it a lot harder and they could throw a lot harder. But there we go. Those are the figures I got for that. Now, the FPV model, I flew it in the same way that I flew it at the park, which is not full throttle, it's just cruising around nice and slowly, and I got 7 meters per second as the velocity. So then I threw all these numbers into this formula to work out the energy, the amount of energy, kinetic energy, these three objects had, and this is what we got. The softball, although it was only 195 grams, had the most kinetic energy at 32 joules. And why did it have so much energy? Well, it was, even though it was lighter than these others, it was traveling much faster. And as I said, the, the velocity makes the big difference. It's the speed, you know, double the speed, four times the energy. So small changes in speed can make a big difference to the amount of energy that you're getting. There we go. So I got a uh, 32 joules for the softball. 
So if you get hit in the head with one of my pitches, you're going to get 32 joules of energy transferring to your skull. Not a good look. The football, I got, or well, we got 27 joules of energy. So it's nearly as much as the softball, but hey, it weighs, if you look at that, it weighs over twice as much, but it's traveling slower, right? So even though it's twice as much, uh, it's traveling slower, we got 27 joules of energy. So it, it's, it's still quite a bit of energy. The shocking one, the one that will shock you and will piss off all the people who criticize me for flying this little model in the park, is the FPV model. Traveling at seven meters per second, six joules of energy. Now work that out, that's less than one fifth of the softball. It's nothing, nothing at all. And it's, it's still, um, if you look at it, what is it? Uh, it's less than a quarter um, of the energy of the football, right? Work that out. Um, but just to make things think, I mean, as I say, I'm not an athlete. So I thought, what could an athlete do? How much energy could an athlete do? Now, cricket is another game that is very popular around the world. Certainly outside the USA, a lot of people play cricket. And cricket has a ball, but it's a little bit smaller than a baseball, but, and, and it's not as heavy, I don't think. In fact, well, yeah, it's not. It weighs 160 grams, 0.16 kilograms, right? So it's lighter than a softball. The surprising thing is that a good cricket pitcher can reach nearly 100 miles an hour with his bowl. It's called bowling, it's not called pitching, it's called bowling. So a good cricket bowler can get that ball up to nearly 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour. And if they do, that's 44 meters per second. And the energy that ball carries is 240 joules. 240 joules, that's a huge amount. Way more than our um, FPV model and a hell of a lot more than my paltry little pitch of a softball. That kills, that's the amount of energy will kill you. There have been cricket, batsman killed by being hit in the head and often after a bounce so the ball has already bounced off the ground hit someone in the head and killed them that's why they all wear protective headgear these days so you can get a lot of energy into a ball enough to kill somebody but this the left pv model not so much anyway so that's how we measure kinetic energy and as you can see those are a range of three d things you're likely to find in any park around here so you work out the risk. I'm going to go back. Uh, th this video is just to explain the math and the science. That's the science involved in calculating these numbers, and those are the numbers we get with three everyday objects. So if you've got comments, put them in the space below. I will do another video, if you like, on exactly how um, there are other factors involved in, in risk and injury and danger when you have collisions. And the biggest factor is the, uh, the time it takes to transfer the energy from the moving object to the stationary object. And that is determined by the, very much by the nature of the materials involved. And I can do a video on that if you like, because obviously being struck by a piece of steel with 100 joules of energy is going to hurt a lot more and risk a lot more in terms of injury than being struck by a, 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 you know, a 100 gram feather duster or a pillow, because the transfer of energy involved is completely different in those two different examples. So it's not only the amount of energy that is being uh, transferred, it's how long it takes to transfer from one body to the other determines the injury risk or the risk of fatality. So I can do that in another video if you like. Mention it in the comments if you'd like to see that video with all the maths and figures and so forth, and we'll do it. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Comments to the usual place. Thumbs up if you like the video, thumbs down if you don't. It does apply to the hobby because all our models have energy. And just to finish off, in the European Union, in the EASA, which is a European aerospace regulator type set up, they decided that they weren't, in most countries have got this sub 250, you know, if it's under 250 grams, you don't have to register because 250 grams is safe. Well, as I've proven here, it's not the weight so much, it's the speed that counts. So you can have one sub 250 gram model, like my little FPV model, safe as houses. But if my little FPV model was traveling at 200 miles an hour, well, it wouldn't be quite so safe, would it? Even though it's still sub 250, if it was traveling really fast, it would have enormous energy. Take bullets, for example. They're just a few grams, but they travel at such high speeds that they kill you. Um, so it doesn't have to be a very heavy object, but it can, if it's traveling very fast, then it becomes a risk. So EASA said, or EASA said, we're not so much worried about the weight because we know that speed kills. So we're putting in the energy limit. And I think they um, suggested 80 joules as the maximum energy allowed for a model before you have to register. It goes into another category. You've got to register and do all sorts of stuff. But if your model has a maximum energy kinetic energy of less than 80 joules, or is it 60 joules, then you don't have to register because we consider it safe. So that's an intelligent way of doing it. It becomes difficult to enforce because then you have the police having to work out how many joules of energy your model's got. And you can't tell that until it's moving, so they have to measure the mass and they have to measure the velocity. And they're not really set up to do that out there in the field. So it becomes difficult to enforce an energy-based um, threshold 
for model flying, which is why most countries have gone for 250 grams. But looking at 60 joules, if we say 60 or 80 joules, well, obviously all these balls are quite safe because they fall under that category. But a cricket, if someone bowling a cricket ball could be exceeding the EASA maximum energy level and they'd have to register their cricket ball if it was a model. <laughs> Simple as that. So there you go. That's it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I've got to go. I'm starting to ramble. See you soon on RC Model Reviews.